thanks for coming tonight, um, especially with this very nice weather. It's, uh, it's really good. I wasn't expecting that so many people were turning up, really. So, um, so I'm a, a hematologist, as Chris already said, and I'm heading up the um, Biomedical Research Center, uh, actually not the whole center, but just the Molecular Diagnostic uh, Lab. Um, and really, the, the aim of this laboratory, it's a, it's a hybrid lab. The aim of the lab is um, both to provide diagnostics for uh, patients with cancer and hematological malignancies, but then also to develop that diagnostic and the diagnostic techniques further. And that's really where the interest of the NHR is coming, uh, is coming in. So <clears throat> personalized cancer care um, has been around for a long time. And... Um, um, this is Hippocrates, and so he, he's basically already said in a long, long time ago that we should treat uh, the person rather than the disease, um, and that we also try not to do harm in that process. And, and those are really, I think, the, the kind of underlying principles of personalized cancer care, um, and they're, they're really important, and we mustn't forget them. Um, so uh, uh, Mark has already mentioned this. Personalized cancer care in the modern language is that you know, we try and give the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. And so the question is then what, are, what is required in order to fulfill um, personalized cancer care? And, and so, um, so really the, the initial thing that I'm sure everybody has had contact with, uh, with a GP or with a specialist in the hospital, the, the initial thing that we are trying to do is uh, taking a medical history and doing that really quite thoroughly because that's where, where really the person and the personalization starts. Um, we try and collect as much clinical data as, as possible, and that's becoming increasingly important, not just for um, routine clinical care of patients, but also um, for actually making sense out of all the information that we are gathering um, about patients. Uh, the social history uh, is really important, as, as Mark already said. You know, there, there are some treatments that we might not want to give to elderly patients who live on their own because they have got side effects um, that, uh, that, that might mean that they have to come into hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning. And so, so the, the social environment and the psychology of the patients are really important and, the, and how well that, per, that patient is in, integrated in, um, uh, and being looked after by their family or by neighbors and so forth and so forth and so forth. And then I put there the DNA sequence, so it's a bit of a jump. Um, but, but essentially what I mean by this is that we are increasingly recognizing that everybody's different and that our, our genes, our, our um, hereditary material is different and that that basically determines how well we might respond or not respond to certain types of treatment and how many side effects we might get because the, the enzymes that are in our gut or in the liver might be metabolizing certain drugs in a very different way um, in patient A from patient B. So, and that's, that's genetics and epigenetics, and, and we are increasingly recognizing that this is really important and that it's part of the sort of personal his signature um, of our patients. So all of that information, I think, eventually will have to go into databases, and, and, and you might have followed some of the discussions in the, um, in, in the press, but there are obviously lots and lots of reasons of why we want to have this data in one place. There are also lots and lots of reasons of why patients might feel frightened of, of sharing this data. Um, and so we have to be you know, really conscious about this and, and manage this really well. Um, uh, so, so then we do need, for, you know, the next thing we need for personalized cancer care is knowledge about the cancer. And, and again, it's not just any type of cancer, it's the, the particular cancer. So when you're presenting to your hospital with a, with a query diagnosis of, of cancer, uh, the first thing we want to do is take a biopsy and put the piece of tissue under the microscope and then come up with this sort of normal classifications of, oh, this belongs to the lung and, and this is coming from the, from the gut and this is coming from the blood. Um, and so these are, these are you know, histologically, um, defin histological definitions and, and categories. Um, and they're in classifications, and they've been around for the best part of, of 150 years, and they, they started to emerge when we invented the microscope. Logical. So, so that's where this is coming from. You look at it under the microscope, and then you come up with a classification. But they don't have anything to do, really, with, with what is causing or what is driving the cancer. It's not the lung, and it's not the gut that's driving the cancer, of course. It's just where it's coming from. Um, so we also take increasingly images of the tumor. So patients are being you know, put through the mill, as I say. They have CT scans, PET, PET scans. They go into narrow, narrow tubes, and they get claustrophobia. And they, there's all sorts of things that we do to patients to try and see um, you know, the extent of the, of the tumor and, and establish that. 
And then again, the DNA sequence. So, so this time, it's not the, the DNA sequence that you have got in all of your cells and in the liver cells and everywhere where you're metabolizing drugs. These DNA sequences are the sequences that are specific for the tumor, so that, that we take from the tumor cells and then we analyze the, 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 the tumor cells um, and we actually compare how much the, the genetic material in the tumor has changed compared to the genetic material that you have got in, you know, in ovaries and sperms and in the rest of your body. And it's those changes, the mutations in the tumor that we are interested in when we're targeting, uh, when we're talking about magic bullets and when we're trying to talk about targeted treatment. Um, so so for, for that bit of, the, of personalized cancer care, what we really need is precise, accurate, um, standardized and fast tests. The last thing you want as a patient is wait for your test result. You've just been diagnosed with cancer. You don't want to hang around and wait for, for, for five months before the results come back because you, know, you might be dead by then. So, 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 so it's fast. They have to be accurate. You don't want to be you know, being told that, oh, you'll be responding to, to drug A that has got a lot of side effects when actually you'll be responding to drug B um, that doesn't have any side effects. So you need to, you know, these tests have to be very stringently uh, validated and, and um, uh, foolproof. Um, and then obviously the, the next most, well, one could say most important thing is you need effective drugs and they need to be effective. They need to have possibly, hopefully, no, not many side effects. Um, a lot of the time patients also say that you probably don't want to be on a drug for life. Uh, ideally, it should be orally available and you should take it by mouth and not having, having to come to hospital for, for endless drips. Um, they need to be cheap. Uh, so there's quite a few attributes that, that we need um, to, to, to deliver personalized cancer care. Um, <clears throat> so some of the personal factors that influence the response, I've already mentioned some of them, and Mark has as well. It, it, the way we do this on a day-to-day -day basis, and we have done for a long time, is that we, that we take a history, we look at the age, we look at the, the sex of the patient, the ability to tolerate treatment, other illnesses um, are really important. Um, and then we look at the increasingly at the biological characteristics of the cancer. And so I've mentioned already the, the DNA and the genetic material, but there are proteins, of course. The ability to evade the immune system, that's an Im increasingly important um, uh, area that, that research is being done. Um, and then whether or not you know, there is blood supply that, um, uh, to, the, to the cancer that, that might, um, and the, the functional behavior of the cancer cells that Mark has already mentioned. So, so cancer is a genetic disease, and this is really where my kind of principle, the first principle comes in. So, so although there might be lots of other things that we might want to look for in cancer, you know, proteins and expression and all sorts of things, but actually, if we say that cancer is a genetic disease and if it cancer is, in, you know, uh, is actually driven by, by these changes in the genetic material, then surely that's where we have to look for first if you want to understand cancer. And so the way we, 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 we currently think about cancer is that it is, a, um, that it is caused by, by mutations, by these genetic changes that occur maybe in something called a cancer stem cell, um, in some cell that originates somewhere in the lung or somewhere in the, in the gut or somewhere in, the, in your bone marrow and that then uh, accumulates mutations over time. And so, um, so usually you don't need just one mutation, but usually there's a whole bunch of mutations and the number of mutations varies from cancer to cancer, but classically in, in leukemias, which is my area, you know, between 10 and 20 mutations are enough to cause leukemia. Um, and so you accumulate those mutations over time, and then you're being diagnosed at some point with leukemia, um, and then you get treatment, and then at relapse, very often, you have more mutations. So the relapse cells um, and the, the leukemias or the cancers at relapse look genetically different from, um, from the, the ones at diagnosis. And it's also important to bear in mind that, that even at diagnosis, you know, within one tumor, you don't just have one type of cells. Um, tumors are very heterogeneous and the mutations that occur, they occur at random and then they're being selected by the, by the environment of the tumor. So, um, so that they're, even within one tumor from one single patient, you have got lots of different mutations in each cell. Uh, and so that's basically what makes it so challenging to, to treat cancer, because you can't just use one hammer and say, okay, fine, that's done. Because uh, there'd be always some cells that will escape that, that one hammer. Um, 
So to understand all that is really important. Um, and what we find increasingly is that it's not just good enough to look for one or two mutations and changes, the ones that you know, are published in the Daily Mail you know, that, that are sort of uh, being targeted by magic bullets, but that we have to have a much broader approach and look at you know, the whole picture to understand what's really going on um, you know, in terms of interactions between all these different mutations. So, um, so how, how do we then go on about treat, trying to treat these cancer cells? So obviously, I'm, ju I'm just focusing on, on the different drugs. Um, and Mark has talked a lot about surgery and radiotherapy. In hematology, by definition, very often, you know, we have to use um, mostly uh, chemotherapy, well, uh, not chemotherapy, but, but, but tablets that you take and that treat the whole body because by definition, blood, blood cancers are, are everywhere in the body. So, so I'm much more familiar with, with giving tablets than applying radiotherapy and so on. Um, so there are different types of drugs that, that are around. And this is a cell, uh, sort of a 3D picture of a cell. And you can see inside the green ball, that's the, that's the cell nucleus. In there is the genetic material. And traditionally, what we've done with chemotherapy is we're trying to induce more changes in the chemotherapy so, so that the cell then says, OK, fine, I don't understand that anymore. The messages that are coming from the nucleus, and I'm not going to divide anymore, and I'm going to die. So that's how chemotherapy works, it, it, by inducing additional changes in the DNA. And when you're thinking about you know, cancer as being a genetic disease, you could argue, oh, my God, you know, does that not make things worse? Because I'm actually, you know, I've already got changes in the DNA, and now I'm inducing more changes, and that may, might make actually things worse. Um, and, you know, some people say yes, some people say no, and I think probably both are right. So, so then there are, outside the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, there are lots of uh, proteins and signaling molecules, and they're really there to, to signal the, the messages that are coming from outside the cell um, and from the cell environment in the microenvironment, um, and to signal to signal those through the cell uh, into the nucleus, and then you've got the cell surface markers, uh, and uh, they are often targeted by antibodies. You might have heard of. So, and they are basically there to um, to receive all these different messages that are coming you know, from the microenvironment to the cell, and and. We are trying to target, you know, with the new targeted treatments, all of these different proteins, cell surface markers, um, also stuff that's going on in the, in, in the green ball, in the nucleus. And then on top of that, we're also trying to target the microenvironment. And the immune system is obviously an important part of the microenvironment. And, um, um, and we're trying to enhance certain um, reactions of the immune system against the cancer cell. We're also trying to dampen down other reactions um, and then there's also other you know, stroma cells, cancer-associated fibroblasts, um, nurse-like cells, all sorts of other cells that sit in the tumor that are not part of the tumor, but that sit in there and that basically you know, send out messages to the tumor saying, OK, you have to divide, you have to divide, you have to divide. And so if you can switch off these messages, then that's a really powerful tool to switch off you know, tumor growth. Um, so I just want to now go on to one particular type of uh, disease that I'm interested in. It's called chronic lymphocytic leukemia because that's where I, I mainly work on. And I want to share some of the sort of really basic personalized medicine that we are trying to apply to um, this disease. Uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is, um, is, an, is the most common type of leukemia, um, but most people won't have heard of it. It's most common in, in elderly people. Quite often patients have other health problems. They, they might have had a heart attack, stroke. Um, uh, it's a B cell malignancy, and very often, because it's, it's a cancerous disease of the lymph gland tissue and of the immune system, it can cause problems with immune deficiency. So very often patients, they don't suffer so much from the actual leukemia, but they suffer from these consequences, and they get recurrent infections, pneumonia, um, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then over time, obviously, they then also develop anemia and other signs of bone marrow failure. CLL can't be cured. Um, unless you know some patients are cured very you know, early on with a bone marrow transplant, but um, that's a very um, very few patients. Most patients can't be cured, and, and you can treat the CLL with chemotherapy, but then patients relapse again, and then they get more treatment, and then they relapse again. So the quality and the durability of responses decline over time, and that's really you know where the the unmet clinical need is because we we want to extend these times of remission, where patients are feeling better. So the funny thing with CLL is, although you know we've we're, again you know we're diagnosing it by looking down the microscope, and, and those are the funny blotches there. They're basically CLL cells, um, but 
you know, whether this is a patient who will need a transplant and, or be dead in two years, or whether it's a patient who never requires treatment, um, we can't tell by looking down the microscope. And CLL is a very heterogeneous disease, so some patients, they, they, they're being followed up for 20 years by their GP and they never had any treatment, whereas other patients have said they need treatment within, you know, a couple of years from, from being diagnosed. And just looking down the microscope, I've got no idea, you know, whether you belong to one or the other group. So, um, and that's just reflected by, by, by this graph as well. So when we give those FC or FCR, these are just types of chemotherapy. When we give those patients chemotherapy, um, you can see that in first line or then in subsequent line, really the 50% of patients um, will relapse within the first two years of having had uh, chemotherapy. Um, now, this chemotherapy, because it's there, often the patients are elderly, although this is, you know, tablets, chemotherapy, and it's well tolerated, it doesn't make your hair fall out, none of these horrible things that you hear about, it, it actually um, does have side effects. And the main side effects in particular in, these, in, in CLL patients is that it increases the risk of infections. You, know, you give somebody with you know, somebody normal chemotherapy, they, they will have an increased risk of infections, and with the CLL patients it's even, it's even worse. So for a long time, we've been wondering about how can we identify patients who don't benefit from chemotherapy um, because they will be relapsing very quickly anyway. Um, and so there's been, there, we, we can do this currently um, for about 4% 4 pa 4 of patients who present or 8% with relapse disease by looking for a specific genetic marker called TP53. Um, but for the others, the other 25 or 50 percent of patients, we, we, don't, we can't predict, you know, do they benefit from chemotherapy? The other problem with the, with the chemotherapy is it's not just you know, causing problems with infections. It can cause bone marrow failure, and it, it costs 14,000 uh, pounds per course. So that's cheap in the big scale of things um, when you're talking about cancer treatment, but it's still 14,000 pounds that in 25 percent of patients you might not, you know, that, that, that you might throw actually um, out of the window. So um, what do we do with those patients or what would we do with patients who don't respond to chemotherapy? Well, there are very potent targeted agents available now and one of them is called ibrutinib and that is, this is just a simple picture of what's happening in the CLL cell. On top you see some W, it looks like a W, it's actually the, BCL, the B cell receptor. So that's the main signaling molecule on a B cell. And it's the main way the B cell can, can communicate with the, with the microenvironment. So basically what ibrutinib does, it just switches off the signaling pathway um, that, goes, um, that, that makes the cell grow. And so the initial responses that were presented a couple of years ago now in a, in a very very filled, filled, in a filled up space in, in an American meeting. Um, the 50 means from 50 with the yellow line, the orange line, that's really where patients underneath, uh, the patients who fall underneath have had a response to ibrutinib. You can see that the vast majority of patients who, who didn't respond to chemotherapy, who had previously chemotherapy, now respond to ibrutinib. That's a major, a major improvement and a major breakthrough. Um, when you're looking at um, the, the overall on, the, on your right and then the progression-free survival so of these patients treated 30 months, this is a 30-month follow-up, you can see that the vast majority of patients are alive and the vast majority of patients have not relapsed. This is normally this curve in pre-ibrutinib times, this curve would uh, actually have touched um, you know, the, um, the, the, the 25 months approximately, it would have touched the, uh, the, the horizontal line. So this is a ma it's a major Im improvement and breakthrough in the way we can treat um, uh, patients with, with relapsed refractory disease after FCR treatment. Now, the problem is $125,000 a year, and you have to be on the drug all the time. So the very few patients where we stop ibrutinib, the CLL comes back within days and weeks. So, so, so these are the challenges that healthcare is uh, facing at the moment. Um, all CLL patients together, as I said already, it's the most common type of leukemia. We could easily spend 1% of the total NHS budget just on ibrutinib if we were going to start treating all CLL patients with this drug. That's, that, and those are the, some of the challenges, really. So um, 
so how, what tools do we have, you know, in the clinic traditionally to kind of say, okay, should a patient get ibrutinib or not? Well, first of all, it's try and error. We give somebody chemotherapy. If it doesn't work, we then say, okay, maybe that patient should have ibrutinib. In the course of that, obviously, we're giving 25% of patients chemotherapy that doesn't work, that is toxic, has got side effects, and so forth, and so forth. Um, we're then trying to kind of say, oh, maybe older patients with impaired kidney function, they should get milder chemotherapy, or maybe those are the ones who should get abrutinib. But then they're also the ones when NICE does our costing, the complicated costing that they do, the, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, the elderly patients are also the ones that, that less benefit less from treatment because they, they're from expensive treatment because they, they die you know, sooner than the younger patients. So they are, they, it's, it's really complicated. Um, so, so the other thing we say is a younger patient without any other disease, diseases will, will have more intensive and effective chemotherapy. They might tolerate more side effects. So maybe they are the ones who should get chemo and not the ibrutinib. Um, but then um, the, the question is, some patients have a genetic subtype of CLL. That means that they don't respond to chemotherapy. And I think that's where you know, we, we should start. So what we said in, in, did in our lab is essentially, we, we, as I said before, rather than just looking for one genetic abnormality, we're looking for all of them. We're doing whole genome sequencing on the tumor, on the germline, and then we know what's going on in the genes. And that's the idea where we start, and that's still, still very much work in progress because whole genome sequencing is, is still not something that you just do um, you know, in, your, in your lunch break. Uh, but we are using kind of different, uh, different big machines for this. Um, and we're, we've set all this up in the NHS lab um, with all the kind of typical challenges associated with the, NG, and with the NHS, you know, uh, clinical informatics and plugging in the, the, right, you know, the right machine into the right IT system and so on. So pretty horrible ch challenges. We also can't use cloud computing because the Department of Health obviously wants to keep everything on servers and make it all safe. And although we're all doing our banking through the cloud, this particular bit of the project has to be on a server, and so we, we're not allowed to use even private clouds for this. That, that leads to significant challenges in, in the bioinformatics of the, of the um, whole uh, genome sequencing. And, um, so, but we go through the whole process. You know, we, 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 we've looked at ethics, different types of ethical consent, uh, patient preference, um, what do patients want, do they want whole genome sequencing, do they want to know whether they respond or not to, to treatment before we're giving it to them. Um, there's lots of processes in traditional pathology that we have to adapt to make this actually work in, on routine samples that are coming from routine biopsies in the NHS. Um, and then the big chunk of this is the health economics because clearly you know, whole genome sequencing, all these expensive kit tools are not cheap. And so we need to make sure that we are not using up all our money in the NHS with you know, clever diagnostics and then don't have any money left for the, for the, for the treatment. So we need to be you know, careful of, of how we're dealing with this. Um, now, the problem that causes, though, is that when you are starting to subgroup patients, so CLL is already a subgroup of lots of other leukemias, um, then we have got these genetic subgroups that we're now classifying the patients into we are getting smaller and smaller subgroups. And the whole point of having um, you know, clinical trials is that you're having large numbers of patients and you're putting one, one patient in group A in, on treatment R, A and the other patient in, into treatment B, and then you're comparing the two. So you need large sets of data in this, these classical trial designs. And so that's, I think, is, is a big, another big challenge. And because eventually, personalized medicine means n equals one in statistical terms. So it means that every patient is different and every patient will get a slightly different treatment. Um, and how can you then prove that that treatment is the best, patient for that, uh, best treatment for that patient because you haven't got a control? And so that's, that's really where, where, where there's a, the problem at the moment, I think, and everybody's having a headache with how can we, going forward, actually realize this concept of, of uh, personalized medicine. So, so one of the kind of attempts to solve this is big data. And it essentially means that we, okay, we accept every patient is different. We just put all the data on this patient into a big database, and then we match inside this database, and we're now talking about like at least 50,000 patients. Uh, we are inside this database trying to match the next patient who comes through the door uh, to 
the best match inside the database. And then we see you now how did that patient in the database, how did that patient respond to the treatment? And does this inform how the patient who, was, who I've just seen would respond to certain type of treatment? So you're really trying to um, accumulate a lot of data and, and, and try and m come up with best matches. Um, um, and that's, um, that's a big challenge. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's just a joke. So, so essentially that what that means is that, you know, to some extent everybody becomes a bit like a barcode, but it doesn't mean that it becomes impersonal. I mean, it becomes even, you know, it does become personal. Although you're part of a big, big, huge database, you're, you're still kind of an individual. Um, so, so what do patients think about this? As part of the, our CLL work, we, we wanted to understand more about what patients feel about genomic testing and genetic testing and how important they think this is. So we did a big survey on on 2,000 patients from the CLL Support Association, which is the patient association here in the UK. And um, we haven't really finished analyzed all of this yet, but just to give you a little bit of a flavor, um, the number of days between providing the blood sample and receiving the test results, patients with CLL actually thought that 14 days was enough. Um, they certainly didn't want to wait for longer than three weeks uh, for the test result. Um, and that's quite a challenge because we are doing, you know, whole genome sequencing and we're doing kind of really complicated things. So to do this in 14 days is, is quite a challenge. Um, the ability of the test to predict who will not respond to the usual chemoimmunotherapy treatment. You know, the people found that this was really important. Um, and I think there's a little bit of education we have to make because people thought that the test reliability should be 100%. No test ever is 100% reliable. So the best you get is 95%. Even the kind of diagnostic tests that your GP does, there's always a range limit. There's always um, a bit of a variation. Um, so it's, you, know, you can't get 100%. Um, the length of time a healthcare professional spent prescribing the test and the test results to you, 15 minutes they thought was good enough. Now, I have for a follow-up to see the patient, to, take, to do everything, prescribe the medicine, do the whole lot, 15 minutes from the NHS just to, prescribe, to, to, to explain the test. Um, I mean, that has you know, huge implications on the time my patients have to wait in clinic. Um, but it, it's, it's good, and I think that's where what we should be aiming for. We should be aiming for, um, for explaining it properly. Um, and then patients felt also that these test results should be you know, explained by a consultant and, and maybe not by, by a junior doctor. So um, last but not least, I finish off with Genomics England, and you may or may not have heard about this, but it's something that we in Oxford are getting increasingly involved with. So, so this is, is, a, is an initiative by the NIHR and the Department of Health to drive the uh, personalized medicine um, using genomic uh, testing. And so the, the, uh, the government has given 180 million investment to, ca to sequence cancers and rare diseases, uh, patients with rare diseases, and in the next three years. Um, to create capability for this sort of analysis in the NHS, and this is where our work comes in, because that will, might drive the prices down for whole genome sequencing, and it might eventually improve outcomes, and that remains to be seen. I think that one of the big aims of this is that we would have, a, at the end of it, um, a very well clinically annotated genotype phenotype database, so where the genetic information is linked in with the clinical data inside the NHS firewall, um, that would then allow us to you know, go through these you know, 90,000 uh, results and, um, and start to begin to unpick you know, some of the characteristics of the, of the different patients and whether or not they might respond to treatment.